Amen. All right. Y'all know how I got to start it out. You know I got to start it out with some laughter. There was a, a young man who was going to visit his grandfather. And, you know, he knew that his grandfather was having some memory issues and wasn't remembering things so well. And he had went to the doctor to get some medicine to help him. So he sees his grandpa and he says, you know, hey, grandpa, I heard you went to the doctor and they gave you some medicine. Uh, what's the name of the medicine that they prescribed to you? And his grandpa thought for a second and he said, well, I, I can't remember it. And he thinks for another second. He says, uh, he says, hey, what's, what's the name of that real popular flower, that flower that people give to each other? And his grandson said, oh, I don't know, grandpa. Is it a, is it a tulip? No, it's not a tulip. It's, it's real popular. Husbands give it to their wives. And he said, I don't know, is it a carnation maybe? And grandpa said, no, no, that's not it. It's a, it's a red flower. It's red. And the kid said, oh, is it a rose? Grandpa, grandpa said, yes, that's it, rose. He said, rose, what's the name of that medicine the doctor prescribed me? <laughs> oh, man. All right, we're jumping in today. <laughs> we're in a series called Us Versus Them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This series is all about breaking off the old habits that we sometimes develop of having an us versus them mindset regarding those who are not in the church. Sometimes we get in these ruts of sort of separating ourselves because we've been in church for a while. And so we start to think, and it's subconscious, it's not often active, but we subconsciously think, well, if they're not church people who do churchy things, who go to my church, and who speak like church people and do all this stuff, then I'm not really interested in associating with them. Breaking off that mentality of us versus them and being the light and the witness to the world that we've been called to be. I want to get a quick feel for the room. I'm going to take a quick poll. Uh, there's a few different groups, I believe. Now, there's one group that there may be some in here that you have not chosen to receive Christ as your Savior yet. And if that's you, I want to say, I'm glad you're here today. I'm so thankful that you chose Claus and that you're even willing to be here in the first place. And my prayer, our prayer, is that God reveals himself to you in a real and a mighty way today. But there's two other groups that I'm going to get some hand raises on this one. Uh, by raise of hands, who in here would say that you have what I might call an R-rated testimony? I'm talking about before you found Jesus, you were jacked up, messed up. Anybody by raise of hands? Okay. The people in prison look at you and they're like, man, I'm glad I'm not out in the free world with that guy. I mean, that, that dude's messed up, right? <laughs> Drugs and alcohol are just like the small part of, of your testimony. I mean, it's, it's messed up. All right. I knew we'd have a lot of hands because this is Clawson, baby. That's how we do it here. Amen. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm actually very interested for this one. And notice my hand is the first one up right here. How many of you however, have ever thought, uh, honestly, honestly, my testimony just isn't that exciting. Anybody? I'll put it this way. Do we have any church kids in the room? Shout out to the church kids by raise of hands, right? <laughs> you think, you know, I, I, I'm, it's just not that exciting. I, I, I grew up in church and I found Jesus at a, at a pretty young age. And, and, you know, maybe from time to time I would get off track, but for the most part, I've loved and served Jesus my entire life. The closest thing I've done to drugs is ordering cheesecake at the restaurant for dessert when I'm feeling wild, right? I mean, that, that's the, uh, my testimony just isn't as exciting as some of the other people's. Let me be honest when I say that that was me. That is me, that I was the church kid. I grew up my earliest memories. I was going to church every Sunday and every Wednesday and several times in between on certain weeks. Uh, I grew up in a Baptist church and came to Clawson when I was very young in 2005. I've been here for 16 years here at Clawson. I still can't believe it. Uh, let's have some fun. I gave Andrew this picture. This is what I was dressed like on my first Wednesday night here at Clawson. I believe we got the picture. Yeah. <laughs> now, that is a suit and tie. Do you know what kids at Clawson on Wednesday nights don't wear a suit and tie. <laughs> it took my brother about two years to break the nickname Sooty because that's what everyone called him when we wore our suits and ties on our first Wednesday. You can put that down. <laughs> Let's not look at that anymore. I was a church kid. I was that kid that, that you know, I, I got involved in, in ministry at an early age. I was the kid 
that I was so young when I got baptized, you'd see it and be like, does he really know what it means or did he just want to get in the water? (laughs) Y'all know what I'm talking about. I don't have to keep going. So I say all that to say that right now I want to be vulnerable and I want to be honest with you and tell you that for my entire life, I have fought and I have struggled with this us versus them mentality. Maybe it's just me, but many times I was that one that when the pastor would say, hey, go find a lost friend and invite him to church, I'd be like, all of my friends are in church. I don't know, I don't associate with anyone outside of my little group. I was that person that at times that if a person didn't go to my church or look churchy or act churchy, well, then I I wasn't interested in having anything to do with them. Can I be honest? There have been times, there were times that I rarely thought about the lost. I rarely thought about how to reach the lost or how to better love the lost because I just didn't care that much. See, sometimes there's this habit of the longer we're in church, the longer we're planted in church, the more we kind of put on our blinders and we start to only focus spiritually about what's going on in the four walls, right? That is one of my favorite things, my favorite things about people who are brand new to Jesus and brand new to church, because they have a deep inward urgency to reach out and to bring the people in. I love people who are new to Jesus and new to church because they ain't scared. They're not scared. They will straight up walk up to you and be like, hey, this is my friend I brought this morning. He's on crack right now, but by gosh, he's here. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) Can you lay your hands on them and cast out the crack demons? I'm like, come on, brother, let's do it right now. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) It's awesome. But what happens many times is the longer, listen to this, the longer we're in church, the less we care to reach out of church. Anybody know that that tends to be true? Sometimes we just, that fire that was in us before, that fire to reach the lost and to reach out and to say, hey, I got to share the message, turns into more of a mundane, well, I'll come to church and I'll lift my hands in worship and yeah, I'll sign up for one of the small groups and I'll go to the fellowship nights and hallelujah, praise God, I'm a good, good church person. Meanwhile, we never reach out to the lost Our heart to see the world saved has all but vanished, and the thought of sharing the gospel is foreign to us. It's from another world, this idea of of going out and sharing the gospel. That's the place that at times in my life I have been at, totally complacent. And you know what's scary about complacency? Proverbs 1 verse 32 tells us that fools are destroyed by their own complacency. A foolish man is destroyed by his complacency. You know what else is scary about that us versus them mindset? It's the exact opposite of how Jesus did ministry. Literally the exact opposite. What did Pastor Josh, what were his foundational scriptures from last week? Matthew 9 verses 10 through 13. Matthew 9, 10 through 13, I'll recap it real quick. He said, later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do, amen? Then he said, go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come, listen here, to call those not who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Why does the leadership of that Clawson church, why do they bust in all those rowdy, wild, misbehaving children? Because they desperately need the great physician. Why on earth? Why did, why did so-and-so bring that person to church today? They're clearly hung over. They're clearly on drugs. They, look at how they're dressed. Yeah, they need a touch from the Lord more than we could possibly realize, more than we could even comprehend. How about this one? Y'all don't chase me out of town on this one here. How about this? Why doesn't the preacher, why doesn't he preach deeper sermons on Sunday mornings? I'm not getting fed. I'm going to leave because he's not preaching deeper sermons 
Have you ever thought it might be because Pastor Josh's job is to make sure that if there's someone in this church who has never been in church and never heard the gospel, that he can level with them, and it's our job to feed ourselves the deeper stuff? Okay. Now, for some, you may hear that and get offended, and that's exactly what I'm talking about, breaking the us versus them mentality and realizing that we're not called to just be separate and to let the world burn. We're called to show the world hope. So that leads me to the title of today's sermon. I know I spent a long time laying the foundation. I'm not going to preach long today, I promise. The title to today's sermon is Witnesses to the World. Witnesses to the world. Let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, this is right before Jesus ascended up into heaven. So this is, this is Jesus' final words on the earth. Before he went to heaven, this is the last words that he left the apostles with. Acts 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We will be his witnesses. Now, how do we today in America, how do we contextualize this scripture? Is it saying that literally we go to Judea and Samaria? No, it's interesting. Here's how we interpret it right here. First, when it says witnesses to Jerusalem, that means that we're witnesses to our home and our city. When Jesus shared that with the disciples, with the apostles, that was the interpretation that we take, that when we are witnesses to Jerusalem, that's the folks in our home and in our city and in where we come from. When we're witnesses to Judea and Samaria, that's like saying we're witnesses to our state and our nation. As Americans, we're a witness to other Americans and other Texans. And then obviously to the ends of the earth, it's saying that we are witnesses to the entire world. So essentially, Jesus' message right here is not him saying that, hey, you need to go buy a plane ticket to Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria. He's saying that no matter where you go in the entire world, you are on a mission to be a witness. No matter where we are, if you're taking notes, write that down. I'm on a mission to be his witness. That is what we must understand. We talk about this in the school of discipleship, and I love pointing this out. In this scripture right here, did Jesus say, if you're a pastor, go be my witness? Did he say, if you're an overseas missionary, you'll be my witness? Did he say, if if you work at a church, if you're on staff at a church, you'll be my witness? Or if you're really good at speaking or teaching or preaching, then you're my witness? No. No. He said, go and be my witness. Every single person, listen to this, every person has an obligation, an equal obligation to bear witness to the name of Jesus Christ. Even if you work a nine to five job, yes, we're still witnesses for Christ. Even if I live in a small town and I have the comforts of a small town and I live a simple life. Yes, we're called to be witnesses to the world. Even if I'm not good at speaking or teaching or preaching, yes, we are on a mission to be his witness. When we accept that, when we realize that, it creates an urgency within us that we say, hey, you know what? I love Clawson Church. This is a, a, a great facility we have, 5569 North US Highway 69 in Pollock, Texas. It's a great place for us to meet together, but it's not enough to just sit on the seats. I have to take what God is doing in here and bring it out there. That's the urgency that is created when we realize that we are witnesses to the world. It's like Pastor Josh said last week, one of our values is that we are a battleship, not a cruise boat. We, as the body of Christ, are not designed for comfort and luxury and for a life of ease. It's the same reason that Jesus referred to his word as a sword and not a ham sandwich. Because it's not designed for our own comfort and our own, you know, let's relax and just partake and it's so easy and delicious. No, it's a weapon of warfare. We are soldiers in a war and we are witnesses to the world for Jesus Christ. So... Today, for our points, again, it's not going to be long points, but for our points, I have three characteristics 
of a true witness. So when we talk about being a witness to the world, a true witness to the world, I want us to look over three characteristics of what that looks like. First, we have to accept our role as the witness. And then we can learn what does it mean to be a true witness. So point number one, and we're going to start with the most basic here. And I'm actually very excited for this. Point number one, a witness shares what they have seen. Now, stay with me here. A witness shares what they have seen. Now, I wanted to start so basic because I want to speak to some people in this room this morning who have maybe developed the mindset that, hey, I can't be an effective witness for Christ. I am here to tell you right off the bat that I don't care who you are. You, yes, you can be a powerful and effective witness for Christ. I promise you, you can. In our faith, and I firmly believe this, we really overcomplicate things. Does anyone else believe that? That we just overcomplicate everything? What happens is we hear a sentence like this. We hear the pastor say, you're called to be a witness to the world. And instantly, it ignites almost a fear within us that the enemy places and we hear that and we go, wait, I, I'm called to be a, a witness to the world. No, I, you don't understand. I, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a, a, a Bible scholar. I can't teach scriptures. What are you talking about? I, I don't work at a church or, or I, I didn't go to Bible school. I can't speak. I can't preach. And this mindset that we get of, hey, I'm not called to that because I'm not qualified in those areas has caused so many people, especially the church in America, to say, well, it's just not for me. The, the witnessing, the, the sharing the gospel, that, that's the preacher's job. That's the ones that, at the church. For me, I, I'm just a, a regular person. I, I'm not called and I'm not qualified to do that. For those who have maybe felt that in your life, that you're not called to be a witness, that you're not able even to be a witness, I want us to stop right now and I want us to think, really think with me. You can even close your eyes if it helps you. Think right now, what does it mean? What is the definition of a witness? Don't overthink it. All right, let, pretend you're in law and order. Does anybody watch law and order anymore? Maybe a couple. All right, law and order, right? What does a witness do in a court of law? A witness is literally a person who sees something and they repeat what they've seen. Stay with me. You see what happened. You witness what took place and you go, yeah, that's what happened. You say what you've seen. So where am I going with it? Here's where I'm going. Being a witness for Christ is not complicated. It's as simple as looking at what he's done in your life and talking about it. That's all that it takes. We overcomplicate it so often. You don't have to be a preacher or a master's in theology. Hey, church, has God been good to you out there? Yes, has God been good? Then talk about it. Tell people about it. Has God poured out his love and his faithfulness and his mercy upon your life? Share it. <laughs> you have Facebook, post it on Facebook. You have text, text it to some people. Has he saved you from the depths of hell and called you his child even though you did not deserve it? Yes, he has. Well then, share it. Tell someone about it. We have to understand that, that to be a witness, you don't have to write a 45-minute sermon and get on a microphone. All you have to do is see the goodness of God in your life and share it with someone who needs to hear about it. And it is our calling on this earth. All right, everyone. Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. I think on the screen we just have verse 20, but I wanted to share the context behind this. Acts chapter 4, I'm going to read 18 through 20. It says, then they, and this is the religious leaders, then they called them in again and commanded them, listen to this, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, I love this, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. <laughs> now listen to this here, verse 20. As for us, we cannot help but speak about the things we have seen and heard. <laughs> Could you imagine if the church got there today? If we got to the point where we said, hey, literally, 
I cannot help but talk about the Lord. I can't help but share what he's done. I, I can't contain it in any longer. Do you realize how powerful it could make us? We would be absolutely unstoppable if we would just stop and remember his goodness and share it with the world. So that's one word. If you're just going to take one word from point number one right now, I want to give you your key word. The word is remember. Write that down if you're taking notes. Remember, my challenge to you is to stop this week. Just stop for five minutes. I know your life is busy, but stop and take a few minutes to remember just how good and faithful God has been to you. Because here's the deal. Y'all ready for this? Get ready. The issue is not that God stopped being good. It's that we stopped being grateful. <laughs> it's that his goodness has always stood. We stopped being grateful for it. And there's something powerful that happens in our spirits when we will just stop and remember and say, man, I was on a one-way ticket to hell, but God, I was so lost and I was so drowning in sin and I was hopeless and I had absolutely nothing to offer, but Jesus saw me while I was still a sinner and while I was still drowning and he said, hey, I want that one. <laughs> man. I was without purpose and without joy and without hope and without love, but God freely gave it to me, not because I deserve it, but because he just loves me that much. He just cares about me that much. And you know what? When I remember his goodness and when I remember his faithfulness, I can't help but talk about it. I can't help but share it and get it out there to the world and show them what my heavenly father has done. Here's what it boils down to. Your heavenly father is crazy about you. He's crazy about you. Go tell the world that he's crazy about them too. Don't be selfish. And I'm talking to me too. Again, I fought the us versus them mindset. Don't be selfish. Tell the world, hey, my heavenly father is crazy for me. And he's the same way for you as well. All right. One of my favorite scriptures right here. My favorite scriptures, it might be my favorite, depending on the day that you ask me, but this is foundational in my life. And it's Acts chapter 20, verse 24. And I pray this scripture over my life as often as I can, because I want this to be me. The apostle Paul said this, he said in Acts 20, verse 24, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. My life is worth nothing to me unless I'm doing his work. Lord, take me there. Lord, get me to that place, please. Please to where if I'm not spending my time being a witness, I say, you know what? That's worthless. I don't want it. If I'm not spending my days proclaiming his name and sharing others the good news of his amazing grace, my life is not where it needs to be. It's nothing to me unless I use it for that. Take me there, Lord. Take me there. Anybody else want to pray that prayer? Take us there, Lord, to where that's all that life is worth. I want to end this point with a powerful, powerful example, because when we hear testimonies, it's powerful and it changes something in us when we begin to hear testimonies. So I just want to take a couple minutes just to share an example of the sheer power of just speaking what God has done. Not in a complicated way, not in I'm writing a sermon and I got to go preach it at a church way, just literally just speaking and sharing the witness of Christ. Let me share with you a story. Two years ago, I was healed of asthma miraculously. I, I, when I say miraculously, I mean every day I struggle with breathing and I took inhalers. To this day, I have been healed. I have never struggled. Healed miraculously in a moment just like that. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. When that happened to me and when I saw, oh my gosh, miracles are so extremely real because I can breathe right now. When I saw that, something stirred within me, a desire to see miracles. And I began to share this testimony when I could. So fast forward a year after that, we're at staff outing and our staff collectively sort of has this vision to change the way that we do what we call passionate prayers into something called miracle nights. And it's a night where we just gather together and we pray to see miracles take place. 
So we change and we switch over and we start our miracle night. And on our very first miracle night, we saw all kinds of amazing testimonies come forth. But one of them that really, really amazed us was Ashley. I don't know if Ashley and her family are here today because she's pregnant, which is part of the testimony. She had been trying to have a baby for over a year with no success. She had scheduled doctor's appointment to start the process of expensive surgeries to try to help her to get pregnant. She comes to miracle night and the Lord tells her, hey, cancel those doctor's appointments and go get prayer. And a week later, she's pregnant with her baby boy and they're due any time now. Okay, so that happens at miracle night. And what does she do? She shares it. She talks about it. She did it over a video, in fact. It was just a video that we made, and we began to share it. When that testimony started getting out, Miracle Night blew up. At our last Miracle Night, it almost looked as full as a Sunday morning service. I mean, it was amazing to see. And since then, we saw more and more miracles take place. Well, fast forward to a couple months ago. And David, and I'm going to share this because I know he wouldn't mind. David comes to a miracle night and he had heard, he had heard witness of the testimonies of what God had done. And he said, hey, you know what? I want that. And the Lord showed me I'm going to get a miracle. He showed up. He had been an alcoholic his entire life, drank every single day. Since that night, he was delivered and set free, has not touched a drop of alcohol since that night. <laughs> 24 hours ago, 24 hours ago, I'm sitting in our Saturday morning men's purity class that Brother Nick leads, which is amazing, by the way. And I'm sitting in this class next to a good friend of mine. And he says, man, I went to that miracle night a, a few weeks ago. And he said, you know, I had just heard the, the testimonies and the witness of everything that God had done. And God just did something amazing me in, in that night amazing in me that night. And since that night, I have not drank a drop of alcohol. I haven't smoked weed. I haven't dipped a dip of snuff. God delivered me and set me free that night at Miracle Night. Now, we could pretend and say that that's all coincidence, but surely we're not that dumb, right? <laughs> we're not that dumb, right? Do you see how just simply Speaking the witness of how good God is started a chain reaction of miracles and deliverances that I'm prophesying today is just getting started. I fully believe that. Just a chain reaction of just simply saying, hey, this is how good God is. This is what he did for me. By the way, you can bet you're going to hear my friend's testimony coming up. So Y'all be ready to hear his testimony, him share of what God did. All right. Point number two, being a true witness. Characteristics of a true witness for Christ. Point number two is that a witness always has their defense prepared. A witness always has their defense prepared. Point number one, I wanted to be very encouraging. But point number two here, I'm going to take it a, a step deeper. I'm going to go a little deeper and I'm going to say that not only should we be making an effort to be a witness, but we should be prepared to be a witness at any given moment. Any moment, any second that we are called, we are ready to be a witness. Let me give you the scriptures that I'm getting this from. Let's look at 1 Peter verses 3 and uh, 15. Chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter 3, 15. It says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Amen. But do this with gentleness and respect. Another translation I love says, always be prepared to make a defense for your hope in Christ Jesus. So no matter the moment, no matter what we're doing, we should always be prepared instantly to be a witness for Christ. Anybody have that one subject that you love so much that at any given moment you could just talk about it for 30 minutes uninterrupted? Anybody have that one thing? I, as I was writing this sermon, I thought about at my old work, we had a FedEx driver who never spoke to us, never said a word, would come in, get the packages, and leave. One day he comes into our work 
and somebody just says the word Renaissance Festival. They, they just mentioned the Renaissance Festival. That dude stood at our counter and talked about the Renaissance Festival for 45 minutes. <laughs> I kid you not. He went out to his sword and showed me and, and out to his truck and like showed us the swords that he had bought from the Renaissance Festival. I mean, this dude was obsessed to this day. I don't know his name. We just called him the Renaissance Man after that. <laughs> I thought about my own life, how there have been many times that I had those things that, man, I, if you got me going on a tangent, I could talk and talk and talk and talk about those things. I have a sort of a obsessive personality. I don't know if anyone else does. I fixate, especially when I was a kid. I used to read the dictionary as a kid. I was strange. <laughs> I collected trash bags. That's the God honest truth. When I was a kid, I, I wanted every different color and size of trash bags. So at different times, I would just get hyper-focused and man, I would talk your ear off about whatever interested me. For a while, it was classic rock, if we're being honest. If I had a free moment, I was listening to my music and I could tell you the album and the song and the stories behind the song. I would be obsessed with talking about classic rock. Uh, and what happened is that I began to have these moments as I so sort of started getting more and more real with God and sort of entering into ministry. I started having these moments where I would be going off on one of my tangents and talking like so passionately. And I would stop and I would think, hey, when's the last time that you talked about Jesus this way? <laughs> Ouch, Lord, come on now. <laughs> And not talking about a sermon because you have to preach sermons every Wednesday. But when was the last time you were genuinely so on fire and so invested in the Lord Jesus that you couldn't help but just talk about him? Man, that's convicting. I don't know if it's convicting for anyone else, but in that moment, it hurt me. And in that moment, I decided that if at any point somebody needed the witness, if at any point a door opened up or somebody needed prayer or scripture or biblical wisdom, I would be there and I'd be ready. Why? Because oftentimes Christians are very good at prioritizing everything except for Christ. Oftentimes we get so fixated on all the busyness of life that Christ and his work and his church becomes more of a, when I have time for it, I'll get around to it. What if we made time for Jesus like we made time for football season? What if we made time for Jesus and really prioritized Jesus like we did our vacations? I'll pick on myself now. I'll pick on me. What if we made time for Jesus like we do for our cars. <laughs> that one hurts me, y'all. That one's convicting for me. You know what the Bible says about this? The Bible says, make the most of every opportunity for the days are evil. We are living in evil days and we have to make the most of every opportunity. And we have to be ready to say, hey, even though it's inconvenient, even though I am tired, or cranky, or it's my day off, an opportunity to witness just came up, and I have to take it because I don't get to choose when God is a priority. I don't get to say, oh, no, not you today, Jesus. I don't get to say, well, today or is my Jesus day, and tomorrow is my day. Make the most of every opportunity, for the days are evil. There are certain things and messages that I'll repeat shamelessly all the time. I don't care if I literally preached it a week ago, I'll repeat it again because I just think it's foundational. And here's one of them. This comes from our deliverance class. And when I heard this, it changed my life. Here's the question that was asked. What if the key, think about this, what if the key to someone else's freedom is locked inside of you? What if what someone desperately needs is within you and God is waiting on you to unlock it and to give it to them. What if, and this is harsh, but this is honest, what if there is someone who is dying and on the way to hell and it is up to you to share the hope to them and if you don't, they're not gonna get it. What if the world desperately needs what's inside of you but we say, well, I just don't really have time right now. I'm just in a very busy season. Be ready to be a witness at any given moment for the days are evil. I'm going to end point two by saying this. Right now, 
everyone, sort of a big buzzword in the church is seasons. That's something that a, a lot of people and a lot of preachers are saying, myself included. Oh, well, right now, I'm, this, this is my season of life. Y'all have heard people say that? Well, I, I'm just, I'm entering a, a new season. And oh, well, my, my current season is this. We've all heard people talk about this. In my current season, I'm waiting for the new season of Stranger Things, right? Where everybody's all about seasons right now. And that's fine, and that's good, and I'm glad for whatever season you're in. I'm glad for you. But here's a healthy reminder that Jesus is never seasonal. Amen. Jesus is never seasonal. When God says, do it, we don't get to say, no, it's not my God's season. We say, Lord, send me I'll go. I will be your witness. And that's not just Jordan. That's biblical. Amen. Paul said in 2 Timothy, you know what he said to Timothy? He said, be instant in season and out of season. What does that mean? Be instant in season and out of season. That means even when it's inconvenient, even when it's hard, even when it does not feel like your prime season if God says do it, it is our job to be instant to say yes. If God says jump, we are to be instant to say, Lord, how high? No matter the season, be instant. It got quiet in here because this is a, a convicting thing, including myself. Again, everything I'm saying today, this is just as much for me. But a true witness, a true witness for Christ is always prepared in their defense for him. Be instant in and out of season. All right, point number three is I'm getting ready to close here. Point number three, the third characteristic of a true witness is that a witness is strengthened in grace even during suffering. So a witness is strengthened in grace even during suffering. Now, point not one was meant to be encouraging. Point two was a bit of a reality hit. And point three, I want to go back to the encouragement here. And I want to speak to some of the people that may be sitting there right now. And you may be saying, honestly, you may be saying, Jordan, that sounds good for you. You work at a church. And I'll admit, it's a lot easier to be focused on God's work when you do it for a living. I'll admit that. And, so, and you may be sitting there going, it's just hard to be instant in this season. It's hard to be a witness all the time. It, it, I don't have the strength to do it right now. I can't keep my head above water, and I don't have what it takes to be instant in this season right now. And I want to say to you, for those of you who say that, I want to say, you're right. You're right. We don't have the strength. Our strength is found through his grace. On our own, we will never be strong enough to be instant in every season. Are you kidding me? That's impossible. But through his grace, we are strengthened to be ready to be his witness no matter the season. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3 here. That's 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 3. This is the Apostle Paul again. And he says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. Now catch those words. Be strong through the grace that, Christ, that God gives you through Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Endure suffering with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now what did Paul tell Timothy to do here? He told him to take the witness that's been given to him, to give that witness and teach it to others, and to endure all the suffering that goes along with it. Now, how is Timothy supposed to do that? He's a young leader at a big problematic church. He's got his plate full as it is. How does he do it? As Paul said, be strong in the grace that we receive through God, through Jesus. We are strengthened by his grace. And I am here today to talk to some hearts that are discouraged, that are hurting, that are struggling in your season. And you go, man, this has been hard. And I don't feel instant right now. In fact, I don't even feel like I can keep my head above water. 
I'm doing good just to make it through the day. And I'm here to tell you that you can find strength, that strength can be found, but it's not in yourself and it's not on your own. The strength is through his grace. Yesterday in that men's purity class, Brother Nick put it this way. I loved it so much. The solution to me is not me. Think about that. The solution to me is not me. Jordan does not have a solution to all of Jordan's problems. Because if I did, I wouldn't be in the problems in the first place, right? The solution is found in the strength that comes from the grace of Jesus Christ. And there's something so powerful when we get to the end of the rope and we say, Lord, I've been holding on to all of it and I've been trying so hard with my own strength, but Lord, if you want me to be a witness in this season, I need to be strengthened in your grace. Lord, I I can't figure this whole life thing out. I don't have the key to life. I'm drowning right now. I feel so overwhelmed right now. And Lord, I need to dive back into your grace and find strength again in you. Lord, you want me to be a better witness for you. Lord, you have called me to be instant in season and out of season. And right now, God, if you want that for me, I need to be found in your grace again. In a minute, we're going to pray. And I'm going to give an opportunity for those who need to be strengthened in his grace. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come receive. But I want to end with one final quick encouragement today. And if you haven't been listening to me before, go ahead and listen now. Because here's my encouragement to you. It's found in my favorite clause in value. We have 10 values here at our church. And my favorite one is this. It says, we get to do this. We get to do this. Translation, I get to serve the Lord. (laughs) I get to be his witness. It's not I have to. It's not I'm forced to. I get to. And my challenge to you is this coming week, as you find strength in his grace, when the enemy hits you, and when you feel overwhelmed, and when maybe you're even convinced that you want to give it all up, stop for a moment and remind yourself that, hey, Lord, this is a tough season. This is a brutal season, but I'm thankful because I get to do this. Lord, I get to go through this with you. Lord, I'm being challenged. I'm being stretched, but God, I know that you're growing me, that you're strengthening me, that you're building my character and my perseverance. God, thank you that I'm going through this season. Thank you that I get to grow, that I get to learn these lessons. Lord, being a witness is tough, and it's not always easy to be instant, but God, you loved me when I wasn't easy to love. So thank you that I get to be your witness. Thank you that I get to share your name and to share the good news. We get to do this. Let me invite the band up to the stage. And band, as y'all come up, y'all can go ahead and begin to play in the background. As we came to a close today, I I always just like to stop and pray and ask, Lord, what, what direction are you leading us in in prayer today? And the first direction is one that anytime I'm preaching a sermon, I'm gonna say this. I wanna speak to those of you out there today that say, hey, before I can be a witness for Christ, I need to accept Christ. And maybe today you're in here and you know that you have not made that decision. And allow me to take a moment to witness right now and tell you that 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and he died on a cross to pay the price for your sin. Sin had divided you from the Lord, but he bore that weight and that suffering. And now because of the price paid, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord and places their faith in him will be saved. And he's calling you today to be his witness, but first he's calling you to receive him and to say yes to Jesus today. If that is you in a moment, I'm going to challenge you to receive him. For some of you, you say today, Jordan, it is time that I accept the mission to be a witness for Christ. I've got complacent, I've got comfortable, I don't think about the lost, I don't have a heart for the world like I should, and today I need to remember his goodness. 
I need to remember how great he's been to me and go share it and tell the world about how great he is and how crazy their heavenly father is. Some of you today say, Jordan, I need guidance on how to be instant. I'm struggling in this season and I need the Lord to teach me how to be a better witness, how to be ready and how to be prepared. And then finally, some of you today, in fact, I believe a lot of us, I don't know if everyone will be honest, but I believe a lot of this room today, you need to be strengthened in his grace. You've been finding that strength on your own. You've been crawling your way through life on your own. And today is the day to say, hey, I'm never going to be the witness I should be. I'm never going to live the life I should live if I don't stop and dive back into his grace today and find strength in him. Would you stand to your feet and pastors and prayer partners, would you come up to the front? As they're approaching the front, I just want to encourage you that today the enemy would love nothing more than to talk you out of what God wants to do. Why? Because the enemy loves to rob the witness of the Lord. I'm going to say that again. The enemy loves to step in and to say, hey, they're not going to be a witness. So if today your heart is stirring and you're saying, hey, for whatever it is, for any need, I need to go down to that altar, do not let the enemy talk you out of that. If you need prayer for anything whatsoever, whether it's something I said or something I didn't say, maybe you need healing, maybe you need strength, I don't care what it is, today is your day to receive and to take that witness and to share it. So right now, as the band begins to play, right now, if you need prayer, would you step out and receive today? If you need prayer right now, would you step out and receive? And for those who don't, would you just begin to worship with me today?